Okay, <clears throat> what this session is about is about digging deeper into uh, the Brit Hadashah or the New Testament. And so I want to begin with Herod Antipater the first. Let me bring this little chart up. Okay, first, there was Herod Antipas. There's a lot of Herods. There's a dozen Herods. And if you don't keep the Herod straight, you get confused. So I'm going to straighten out all the Herods for you. May end up making more confusing. But Herod Antipas was an Edomite. And I'm going to show you in a little bit that the Maccabees, remember the story of Hanukkah and the Maccabees. As the Maccabee generations go, one of them forced all of the Edomites to either give up their land or convert to Judaism. Well, Herod Antipas was one of those Edomites who converted, he was a Gentile, but he converted to Judaism. He is the one who fathered Herod Antipater. Now, Herod Antipater married the daughter of an Arab sheik known as Cyprus, and so they were sweethearts and they got married. Now, they had a couple kids. One of them was Salome the first, and the other was Herod the Great of Matthew 2 that killed all the babies when Jesus was born. Okay, so Herod the Great claimed to be Jewish, but his mother wasn't Jewish, and his father wasn't Jewish. He was a convert to Judaism, though. So Herod had 10 wives, all right? I will share with you some of them. His, one of his first wives was Doris, and Herod the Great and Doris had Herod Antipater, named after Grandpa, Antipater II. Well, Herod also had a wife named Malthais. And Herod and Malthais had some kids. One of them was Herod Archelaus of Matthew chapter 2, verse 22. Another one was Herod Philip I, you see in Luke 3, 1. Another one was Herod Antipas in Matthew 14 and Luke 13. He also married a lady, not Cleopatra of Egypt, but Cleopatra of Jerusalem. And now he also married another lady named Miriam II. Now, Herod and Cleopatra had Philip the Tetrarch, that's mentioned in the Bible. And Miriam II, her father was a Levitical priest named Simon Bothus. So he was not, he was the high priest. So here we have this guy that's a high priest from the Maccabees, and they give birth to Miriam II, who is a Maccabee from the Levitical tribe. And there was a problem between the Maccabees and Herod's, Herod, and the way they solved it is by having a marriage. And so now Miriam is married to Herod the Great, and Herod the Great loves Mary Ann, and they have a child called Herod Philip II. And Salome, and uh, who was Herod the Great's sister, had a daughter named Bernice. And Bernice had a couple of kids. One of them was this lady named Herodias, and her brother was Herod Agrippa the first of Acts 12. Then she married Herod the Philip the second, and they had Salome the second, and she married Philip the Tetrarch. Are you following this genealogy? Well, Herodias married Herod Antipas. So you've got quite a situation going on here. But what happened? When Herod the Great was about to die, his firstborn son, Antipater II, there were some problems. He had thrown him in jail. And what happens? He tells the jailer, look, my dad's about to die. Why don't you let me out of jail? I'll kill him, and then I'll make you the jailer, this fancy role in the government. 
So what does the jailer do? He goes and tells Herod the Great, who turns around and has his son put to death. So that didn't work real well. But there's something about Herod Antipater. He was very prideful and he wanted to rule and he was ready to kill his dad. And we're going to look at that incident here in a little bit. But let me kind of cover the story. So here's what we got. Let me come over here to this chart. We kind of just covered all of this. So I'm going to add now. Mattathias, okay, he was a Jewish priest. And he had sons, Simon Thassi, John Hyrcanus then. And he had Judas Aristobulus and Alexander Janus. There was a Salome of Alexandra, and she was married to Judas Aristobulus. And because they're Levites, when Judas Aristobulus dies, she marries his brother, Alexander Janus. And they have Aristobulus II and John Hyrcanus II. And so those are their two kids. And I'll stop there for a moment. And I'm going to read to you what had transpired through all of this. In the days of Mattathias, the one at the top, who was a priest. Remember, David had 24 courses of priests. And Abijah was the eighth course where Zechariah was. The first course was uh, Yehoarib. And what happened, Mattathias was of that course. He decided to leave Jerusalem and go to a little town about, you know, I don't know, 15 miles away called Moedin. Okay, Moedin, that's where the whole story of Hanukkah took place. Well, he's the one, uh, he had five sons. One of them was Judah Maccabee, the hammer. And so he was the son of this priest, and he's the one who led the Maccabean revolt. Well, in 168 is when uh, Antiochus Epiphanes was the big problem. And uh, this is when Simon Thassi, that you see on the left, fathered John Hyrcanus. Okay, well, John Hyrcanus became the high priest. And uh, in the second century BC, around 160, and he died about 104. Well, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were always fighting during that time. Who wants to have control? Well, he sided with the Sadducees. Well, Hyrcanus, the one that you uh, see here, John Hyrcanus the first, he's the one who started a military campaign against the Edomites. And he is the one who insisted on forced conversions and this is why Herod Antipas converted, not because he wanted to, but because he would lose his land if he didn't. Uh, Hyrcanus instituted these forced conversions uh, on the Edomites, and this was unprecedented move for a Judean ruler. And Hyrcanus threatened that any Edomite who wanted to keep their land, they had to be circumcised and enter into the tradition of the Jews. So Herod Antipater, the son of the one who converted, was circumcised around 10 years old, not as a baby. And um, nevertheless, Herod's family, uh, Herod uh, Antipater, his family had very much influence. And they became resented by many of the Jews because they were really Edomites. So what happened, John Hyrcanus, what he ended up doing he ended up dividing the kingdom. This is when the Maccabees were both priests and kings, okay? And so uh, what happened here, in his will, he made a provision that the high priesthood would be separate from secular authority. His widow, who um, was Salome Alexandra, let's see, it has here, was given the control of the throne, of the civil authority, and his son, Judas Aristobulus. You see Judas Aristobulus there? Okay, uh, 
was given the role of the high priest. And so uh, that's how he tried to solve the fights, the inner fights between the families. However, Aristobulus was not happy with that. So guess what he does? He cast his mother, Salome Alexandra, into prison and let her starve to death. That's how he solved that. And then he killed three of his brothers and he imprisoned Alexander Janus, his half-brother. Then Aristobulus was not only the first king from the Hasmonean lineage, but he was the first of any Hebrew king to claim the priesthood as well. But he only reigned for one year. And then Salome Alexandra, who was married to Judas Aristobulus, when he died, there was a Levite marriage where she married Alexander Janus and then had those two kids. But Alexander Janus, even though he was successful uh, throughout the battlefield, he was very Hellenistic, which is who the Maccabees were fighting against. And what Alexander uh, Janus did one time he hated the Pharisees. He was sided with the Sadducees. And on Sukkot, as you know, you have the Lulavs and you have the big yellow etrogs, right? Well, if you remember during the Sukkot holiday, the big deal is the pouring out of the water, the water libation, okay? They go all the way down to the Pool of Siloam. They get this big pitcher of water and a bottle of, of uh, wine and they'd head up to the altar. They'd march around it seven times. And then the priest would go to a corner of the altar and they would pour the water and the wine or the blood in the corner of the altar. Well, he's the high priest and he thinks the whole thing's stupid. So he takes the water and he pours it on his feet. Everybody gets mad and there's a thousand people with etrogs throwing them at him. He gets pelted with etrogs from every direction. And now he is really mad. And so... <laughs> They also said he was a descendant of a illegitimate uh, woman kind of thing. He killed 6,000 people, his fellow citizens, mostly Pharisees, their wives and their children. And this was a major factor that led up to the Judean civil war, which was the Pharisees against the Sadducees. Well, not long after that, the Pharisees, which had a powerful school for rabbis, they incited a revolt that would turn into a six-year-long civil war. During that civil war, 50,000 Jews were killed. Alexander Janus then died in 76 BC and left his kingdom to his wife, Queen Salome of Alexandra. What you're going to see happens, if you remember, it is said that Solomon's temple was destroyed because of baseless hatred between the Jews. They say the, uh, the temple in Rome was destroyed because of baseless hatred toward one another. It's, and the, the whole civil war that they had is what led Herod the Great to take over. They invited Rome to come to solve their problems. This is why Paul says, don't go to the court, solve your problems yourself. When you go invite someone else in, you're causing big problems for everybody. Well, as I said, Salome, Alexandra had two sons, John Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II, and they were fighting over who was going to have the key positions. And so the way they resolved this, John Hyrcanus had... Alexandra, this nice lady, and Aristobulus had an uh, Tigenus, and he's the one who chased Herod away to Rome, but then Herod came back. Well, they also had Alexander. And how do you solve problems? Marry between the families. So Alexander and Alexandra got married. And they had Mary Am the first. So she is also one of the Maccabees, and she also marries Herod the Great. And Alexandra and Alexander also had kids, Aristobulus III, and so Miriam I and Aristobulus III are brother and sister. Now, Miriam with Herod had kids, 
Alexander, and Aristobulus the fourth. But what happens one day, Herod the Great, I'll tell you the story in a little bit, kills his wife and her kids. And I will tell you why shortly. Okay. Mary Ann was revolted by her husband's heartless murder of most of the members of her family in order to satisfy, uh, to satisfy his selfish ambitions. And she was one of these independent women that let him know. And yet, despite this, Herod was madly in love with his wife, too madly in love, but it did not stop Herod from carrying out his ugly schemes. Herod did not want anyone telling him what to do. Well, Mary Ann, her brother is Aristobulus III. What does Herod do? He appoints a non-Levite, unimportant person to become the high priest. Oh, no. Okay, so Alexandra, the right here, the mother of these two wants her son to be high priest. And Herod isn't complying. So what does she do with all of her wisdom? She goes to Cleopatra of Egypt, who's very powerful queen, and she goes to Mark Antony, the ruler of Rome, to intervene with Herod on her son's behalf. That did not make Herod happy. Despite of all of Alexandra's efforts, it was finally, it was Mary Ann who persuaded Herod to depose the other man and appoint Aristobulus to be the high priest. Herod does what she says, and then she, he has him killed and drowned and made it look like an accident. So he complied, and then he killed the guy. All right. Uh, what had happened was there was a festival held in Jericho, and he hired some young men to keep the high priest underwater while he was bathing until he drowned and then have it appear as an accident. Herod appeared to be very, oh, so sorry, but everyone knew it was his fault. Well, Alexandra had even succeeded in having Herod call before a Roman court to answer for the crime. But what does he do while he's in Rome? Through bribery, he ends up escaping blame and punishment and comes back. Well, guess what? Before Herod left for Rome, after Alexandra did that to him, he arranged with his sister's husband. Okay, here's Herod. His sister is Salome, who's married to a man named Joseph. And Joseph, that if Herod was proven guilty in Rome and was going to be killed and not return, Joseph was to kill Miriam and all of her children. Because if anything happened to Herod, he didn't want anyone else to get his lovely wife, Miriam. But here was the problem. Joseph really, really liked Mary Ann. So he goes and tell her what her husband's planning to do to kill her if he dies. Well, that did not make Mary Ann any more happy about Herod. And so <clears throat> she gave him the what for when Herod came back. He said, Joseph told me that you wanted me killed if you were killed. And sometimes you should keep your mouth shut. Maybe better off. But she's just blasting into him. Well, so what happened, Joseph's admiration for Maryam made Herod's sister, Salome, very jealous. And so Salome tells Herod that her husband, Joseph, has a thing for his wife, Mary Ann. You see how this is unfolding? Okay. Well, he ordered his brother-in-law, Joseph, to be killed without even trying to find out if what she was saying was true. But his love for Mary Ann was too strong to punish her. The next time Herod had to go away, he left someone else in charge to guard and watch Mary Ann. 
And he was told to kill her and her children if he didn't come back. Well, Herod came back and his sister again tried to make trouble for Mary Ann anyway. And this time, Salome told Herod that Mary Ann was planning to poison him. And so in a mad rage, he tried, she was tried by the men of his tribunal. And even though she was innocent, they condemned her to death and she died. All right, so you're kind of getting an idea here of all of these guys. Okay, so here we go. All of them were killed. And then Antipater II, who was Herod's firstborn, okay, you have him. But then you have Bernice and Aristobulus. Before he died, they had kids. And guess who they had? They had Herod Agrippa, the first of Acts 12. And they had a daughter named Herodias. And Herodias and Herod Agrippa were brothers and sisters. And Herodias ended up marrying Herod Antipas of Matthew. And they were married and they had a child who was Salome the second. And guess what? Salome the second and her mother were the ones that wanted to kill John the Baptist. And Herod Agrippa had Herod Agrippa the second. All right. So you're following all that. And then Aristobulus the third, who was brother to Mary Am, also was murdered. And yeah, that we got. Okay, now let me go back one again. Now, it was interesting that again, Antipater. The second, he wanted to be king so much he was willing to kill his dad. Now, do you remember the story that they killed all of the babies, two years old and younger, right? So what did Joseph and Mary do? They went to Egypt. But let me explain how all of this happened. I know the exact day and date of Yeshua's birth. He was born on the first day of Sukkot in the Hebrew year 3757 AM, uh, which means from creation, which on the Julian calendar was the fall of 4 BC going into the spring of 3 BC. We know he was born in Bethlehem in the fall of 4 BC. And then we know after a month, he went to the temple to be dedicated. Now, we know that the wise men had not yet come a month later. How do we know what in Leviticus, what did, if they had a son, what was the offering they were to make? After 30 days, he's no longer, you know, unclean. They go, they dedicate the child. What offering was she supposed to bring? A lamb and then a pigeon or a turtle dove. But it says if they were so poor, they couldn't afford a lamb, then they could bring the two turtle doves or two pigeons. And Joseph and Mary brought the two turtle doves and the two pigeons because they were so poor. But what happens, see, this is in like September, October, the last of Sukkot. It was the following month that the Magi came with all of the riches because they couldn't afford it, but they needed money. So God made sure they had money so they had money to support themselves in Egypt. That's why the wise men came. They're about to go into Egypt and they're going to need finances. And if they can't even afford a lamb, how are they going to support themselves in Egypt? So the wise men come the next month and then they get the funds. And then what happens? Uh, the wise men came who had seen the star, but the star actually had come two years earlier. They waited two years from seeing the star to go to Bethlehem to find the young child. And then we know they left a different way. It didn't tell Herod and the, uh, that's why Herod, you know, wanted to have all the babies killed two years and younger. Now, here's my next quiz. How long were Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus in Egypt? How long do you think they were in Egypt? Any guesses? I don't hear anybody. It's okay to be wrong. <laughs> Three years? Yeah, I know. 
He was only there about five months. And I can prove it. I will show you. It's all in the Bible and science and history. Get a load of this. If you go to NASA's website, it lists all of the solar lunar eclipses for 5,000 years. And we find there was a lunar eclipse on March 13th of 3 BC, and it was seen all over Israel. Josephus records this event. Okay, now I'm going to give you another test. You can only have a new uh, a total solar eclipse when? When can you have a total solar eclipse? There's only one day a month you can have a total solar eclipse. On the first day of the month, all of Israel's months are based on the sighting of the new moon. God tells Moses, look at this new moon here. This is the beginning, the first of the month. Okay, now... When can you have a total lunar eclipse only one time a month? The full moon, which is on the 15th of the month, right? Right in there. The middle of the month is the full moon. If this is a lunar eclipse, it tells you it's the middle of the month, right? What is in the middle of the month of March? Purim, Purim, the very day the Amalekites, you know, wanted to kill all the Jews in the book of Esther. So here we see a total lunar eclipse seen in Israel on the festival of Purim while Joseph is still in Egypt with Mary and the baby. Okay, well, Herod was like on his deathbed. And when all the Jews saw the lunar eclipse, they said, hooray, Herod's going to die. That's what this means. Herod's going to die, probably by Passover, okay? So Herod, as you know, he's married to a Maccabee who celebrates Hanukkah all the time. And they celebrate Purim all the time. And in Purim, they make a mockery of the kings, okay, and, uh, and Haman and Amalek, they all make a big party and a mockery. Herod knows how they keep Hanukkah. Herod knows how they keep Purim. And he's afraid after all the celebrations of Purim and then having this, that their Jews are going to mock him and make a fool of him when he dies. And he thinks he's such a great king, everyone should mourn for him at his death. So he tells his troops on the day that he dies, they're to kill like 50,000 Jews so they mourn on his death. He does not want his death to be a day of rejoicing, but a day of mourning. So he tells the soldiers, go kill a whole slaughter, a whole bunch of Jews when the day I die. So they'll remember it as a day of mourning for me. Okay. Well, um, let's see. Another thing. Rome, right before Herod died, Rome had made a demand that Herod put their emblem of a big golden eagle on the entrance to the temple. Well, he complied and he did it. But the Jews didn't appreciate that. And so they tore it down and cut it into pieces. Okay, well... If you look on your notes at Hosea 8, chapter 1, the Jews had read this verse, set the shofar to your mouth. He will come as an eagle against the house of the Lord because they've transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. So they saw this putting up of the eagle as kind of like a fulfillment of this verse, and they tear it down. Well, what does Herod do after they tear it down? He kills a whole bunch of people and he locks the top leaders of the Jews, the sages, up with a command that on the day he dies, they have to kill all of the sages. So they will mourn on the day of his death. Now, here's what Josephus says, who lived during that time. Uh, he said that Herod had no affection or goodwill towards his son, the uh, Antipater II. 
and to restrain him. And so he put him in jail. And it says the jailer said he, that Herod Antipater wanted to kill Herod the Great. So Herod the Great cries out. He beats his head on the wall and he raised himself on his elbow and told his guards and commanded them to go kill Antipater without any delay and then bury him in a horrible way. Well, Antipater had wanted to be king. Herod dies a month later in April, just before Passover. And upon his death, his son Archelaus becomes king and everyone hope it's going to be better. Now, let me come back to here for a second. So here we had Herod Archelaus of Matthew 2, 22. He kills this son from Doris and he wants to put Malthus's son, Herod Archelaus as king. Well, when he becomes king, all the Jews rejoice that Herod died and they're hoping he's gonna be a better king. And so they ask him to let go all of the sages in prison that were supposed to die when Herod died and he just died. Well, what does he do instead? It's Passover. They're celebrating Passover and he sent in armed troops and slaughtered 3,000 people in the temple area. He canceled Passover and sent everybody home. Now, look at Matthew 2, 20 and 21. The Lord speaks to Joseph in Egypt saying, arise and take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for they are dead which sought the young child's life. He arose, took the young child and his mother and came to the land of Israel. It says they, not he. There was more than one person that wanted this supposed Messiah dead. Who was it? It was Herod and his son Antipater because he wanted to become king. He was the one searching for this Messiah to get him killed too. So when it says they, that's who it was referring to. But fortunately, Herod killed his own son and then he died. And then in Matthew 2, 22 and 23 on your notes, it says, when he had heard that Archelaus reigned in Judea in the room of his father, Herod, he sure didn't want to go there. So being warned of God in a dream, he goes instead to the parts of Galilee and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophets. He'd be a Nazarene. So what I'm going to do is take a picture of this chart and have it on the table for you next week. So you can kind of follow along as you read the New Testament to know who's who in the Herod family. But what's amazing is, you know, Yeshua was born like in October on Sukkot. November, the wise men come. December, he leaves to Egypt. And then what happens, January, February, March, this big eclipse comes. That's all recorded in history. And then a month later, right before uh, Passover, Herod dies, Archelaus becomes king. And then Yeshua comes back because they had died who wanted to kill him. But he goes to Nazareth instead of Jerusalem because Archelaus is there as king. Does all that make sense now? Okay. Who wants to repeat it back for me? <laughs> Let's stand and we'll close with prayer.